Sometimes mistakes are okay. Honestly, a lot of times mistakes are okay. You're not always going to be at your best. And the thing with making mistakes or being wrong, as always, failing is a chance to learn, to grow, and improve. And often is the best way for you to do so. And you'll see so often in business and sports that you have plenty of examples of people that have failed, or in some cases failed over and over and over again. And that's why they succeed. Because they found all these ways to not do something before they found a way to do something. When it comes to AEW and this week's Dynamite episode, I don't know what the hell this was supposed to be, but this goes in the category of that's not a way to do it. I realize not every show can be a banger. I realize not every show is going to be truly enthralling and captivating and you can't run full bore balls to the walls all the time because eventually those chickens are going to come home to roost and manifest other problems. But there is a piece of understanding your moment, understanding your situation, understanding your circumstance. And for a company like AEW, that has generated a little buzz and a little momentum for themselves and looking to build and grow upon that with the revelation officially last Friday on Rampage that they made their biggest talent acquisition to date in CM Punk. You would think, you would think that Tony Khan, the EVPs, AEW would want to come out of the gate here with Dynamite the following Wednesday and put on a banger. You would think, almost to the point where you might even undercut the pay-per-view all out a little bit on September 5th. Because the reality is, for AEW, they already do a really good job of converting a, a good number of their regular weekly television viewers into pay-per-view buying customers. You know, a lot of companies wish, you know, even like a WWE back in the day, like they wish they could have done some of the you know, numbers in terms of the percentage of fans that went from television viewer to watching pay-per-views. Now, of course, WWE's audience used to be much bigger, blah, 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 blah. But you got to give the people something here. And this show, I'm sorry, was a boring, wet fart of a miss. It was. Like Orange Cassidy versus Matt Hardy. Once I get past the fact that I kind of wish Orange Cassidy would have just stayed a character and been much less of an in-ring performer even at this point. You know, it just felt like this match was kind of random. I know it wasn't truly, totally random, but kind of felt that way. and felt like an awkward way to start off the show. Like, to me, if you're starting with something that you want to engage the audience, if you're starting this show and you want to get the energy level up, you know, you probably want to give the people something that they're truly actually going to give a crap about. And maybe they do with Orange Cassidy and Matt Hardy, but, you know, it feels like you've invested a lot more time in Chris Jericho and MJF and their story. Maybe that should have started if you weren't flat out just going to start with CM Punk. It could also be a argument here that you should have just started with CM Punk. Why not? Um, the whole Chris Jericho challenging MJF with the career on the line. Like, to me, I kind of run the, the mix of, is that, is that an unnecessary stipulation or is it called for based off of the story? And if you're not going to go there, then why bring it up type of thing? I don't know. One thing I will call out, and it's a little bit of a criticism I've had of AEW in the past, just because you can say shit or other things doesn't mean that you need to do it all the time and doesn't mean that several different people should be saying it on your show. Like we get it. You're gearing towards an 18 to 49 audience and you have the capabilities of saying some of those things on TNT. That's okay. But you don't need to do it all the time. You don't need to do it every week. Mix up your shtick and find, find out a different way to do things. I'm just saying. Especially even with somebody like Jericho, like he knows better. He legitimately knows how to get over without doing any of that dumb crap. So why does he always feel the need now at this point, it seems like, to take the lazy way? Like you hear multiple shits every single week. And, you know, that's something that 
it should stand out when it happens. It should be like, oh my God, it makes it a really big deal when it happens. But when you hear it three, four, five different times on a show, it absolutely does not make anything feel like a big deal. Lucha Brothers Varsity Blondes, this is a tag match for a little mini tournament they're doing to determine who's ultimately going to take on the Young Bucks at All Out. I, I sat here during this match and I just looked at it and I said, man, they really missed the boat with Brian Pillman Jr. Once his dad's Dark Side of the Ring episode came out, there was a buzz behind Brian Pillman Jr. He was a sympathetic baby face at that point in time. He still kind of is, but you get what I mean? Like there was an interest there. It had been peaked. And this company did nothing with it. Like, that was dumb. That was dumb. And even if you fanboy for this company, you can praise the things you really enjoy, but you need to legitimately call out the dumb shit when they do it. That was dumb. The Andrade promo on Pac, like, what has he done? Like, really? Really? There are a lot of people talk about how Andrade was going to be this big deal when he came to AEW. Blink and you miss him. You don't even notice him, really. Like, what impact has he made? The answer to me is about jack squat fucking zero. For some reason, Jamie Hayter and Red Velvet had to have a match. Why beat Red Velvet again? I don't know. That said, when you look at kind of the track record of Red Velvet, like, yes, I think she's sexy. That's cool, but... She's also really damn botchy. She's one of them botchy bitches, if you will, to the point where she's either going to hurt herself or somebody else at some point. Why would you continue to put her in the ring when she can't execute her basic shit? It looks sloppy and it looks dangerous and not in a good or appealing way at all. So then you're going to go from that to saying, you're really going to give Chris Statlander a title shot? Botchlander herself? Oh, my God. There should be something better you could do with the women's division. I'm just saying. Apparently, Dark Order is still a thing. You could have fucking fooled me. The CM Punk interview with Tony Schiavone. You know, this was cool. You know, kind of low-key. And that's okay. You know, the, the big... <laughs> if you're talking about gimmick infringement or ripping off gimmicks... He should have said about the Daniel Bryan piece. He should have said that's somebody else's shtick. <laughs> you, you might not have to wait too much longer. That's not a prediction. That's a spoiler. <laughs> but here with the Punk interview, like it was good, but it felt awkward that it was buried in the middle of the show. And if this was what they were going to do, they should have started off the show with it. Because I actually feel like right here, you start the show at the beginning with this. It just sets up the flow of the rest of the night really, really well. Um, you had a six-man tag. Every time I look at Komarodo, I say, why isn't he a part of the fucking Jurassic Express? Why isn't he their caveman? Like, it's such an obvious fucking thing with Komarodo. Why wouldn't the fuck can't AEW figure this out? This whole alignment thing with QT Marshall is stupid. It's not going to go anywhere. Having a caveman with a dinosaur and his boy... Or a boy and his dinosaur. Oh my god. Merchandise possibilities. Opportunities to make stars. Why in the hell would you want to do that? Like the rest of this show outside of one thing really was really bad. Uh, the John Moxley interview where he's saying that he's going to wrestle Shatoshi Kojima at All Out. Okay. Who the fuck is that and why should we care? And before the hardcore say, well, yeah, I know who he is, so that makes him awesome. And everybody else should research him. No. If you're going to put him on one of your four pay-per-views that you have a year, you better introduce the fucking audience to him. You better make sure that the audience know who's it, knows who it is. This is, again, part of the problem with this company at times. To me, they're too busy trying to appeal to the fans they already have and not trying to grow their audience and bring in new ones. Not everybody cares about this shit. Just because you do doesn't mean that everybody else does. And like, I get it. You're bringing in one of the New Japan dads, so to speak. One of the old hands, the vets. But all the people on the fucking roster, why are you taking one of your more established names in Moxley and associating them with somebody from another company half a world away? That's fucking dumb. 
Team QT and Gun Club, you know, I already talked about that one. I don't even want to talk about that one. There was another six-man tag, and who gives a shit? Uh, probably one of the highlights of the night, and unfortunately it was buried late in hour two, was Dan Lambert's uh, Jim Cornette shtick and promo school that he put out there. Talking about Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. Like, this shit is really good. Like, I totally get why you want to have a Dan Lambert on your television product. You get some of the appeal of Jim Cornette in terms of the work shoots that he could cut without the controversy. Get some of the MMA credibility there. Makes sense. It does. It's just startling how much better he is than 98% of this roster. Startling. Oh, it's a lot easier to be great at doing a promo when you get to do the work shoot, you get to ri- get to run down others. Like that in and of itself is not a talent per se. A lot of people can do that. But Lambert's man really connect. He pieces the story together well. It's just outstanding stuff. And it's a shame that it was buried right here in the middle of hour two. You know, it's another show that I looked at this week and said, instead of picking and choosing their spots and really choosing to feature certain people, they were trying to feature this schmaz of a roster that they have and get as many people on as possible. And that crap just doesn't work. And you look at the main event, no better example of that than this. Malachi Black was somebody you had debuted recently. He was supposed to be a big fucking deal. You put him in this main event, but his opponent is Arn Anderson's son, Brock Anderson. Now, it would be something if Brock Anderson had been on TV consistently for an extended period of time. It would be something if Brock Anderson had been somebody that the fans had been given any reason at all to give a fuck about him other than the fact that he's his father's son. Which to then, if anything, is going to make the fans resent him a little bit because, yeah, it's the lineage of double A for sure, but then how much of this is nepotism and favoritism and all that other crap. And even when you look at this match, like it should have been an absolute squash. It was a squash, but it didn't feel like incredibly impressive or overpowering. You know, afterwards he gets in the fight with Arn Anderson. Like that was a bit of a cool thing, but it was very short and fleeting to the point where you're taking Malachi Black and another member of the Nightmare family comes out. And it'd be like if it was Dustin Rhodes getting revenge for his brother. You're like, okay, you know what? Dustin Rhodes is legit. Dustin Rhodes has decades of experience. Dustin Rhodes is not a small dude. Like we we could sleep sometimes on just you know how big of a dude Dustin Rhodes actually is. Like I could see wanting to walk away from him and gather yourself, but Lee fucking Johnson, that jobber walks out of all damn people, and you're walking away from him, and not even in a way of being like, oh, I don't have time for you, or oh. That's cool. I'll kick your ass later. Just walk out and leave. Like I had tweeted before and kind of like a smart ass, but kind of hoping that Cody Rhodes would show up here because otherwise this match had absolutely no fucking business closing out your show. This left the fans wanting nothing coming back to next week. Like that's the problem. As much as anything else, you could have most of the rest of the show be crap. But at least make your main event strong. At least make your nut a good one. Make the people want to come back for more. There is absolutely nothing, and I want to emphasize again, absolutely nothing about that main event that was interesting, that was captivating, that was engaging, that was going to make somebody say, you know what, I want more of that next week. Inject that straight into my veins. It felt like we watched an episode of Dark where we really needed a two-hour episode of Rampage this week. Like I said... Not everything's going to be great. And not everyone's going to connect. Not everyone's going to be a raging hit. But this felt like a haphazard, half-ass effort by AEW with Dynamite this week. I mean, even the people that I usually see online that stumble over their cells with their AEW love and their AEW bias were very tepid in their reactions to this week's episode. And if they were tepid or lukewarm at very best about the episode, that tells you how much of a steaming pile of dung it was this week. This sucked. Boring, missing the plot, and doing nothing to make the fans want to tune in next week. 